Wow, people are hanging in here with us. That's great. Wonderful feedback. My name's Russ Smith. I'm the superintendent of Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania National Military Park. I have, thank you, thank you. There's, there's my fan. Thanks, Bob. I have the privilege and challenge of supervising John Hennessy. <laughs> My uh, supervisory input is usually limited to, slow down, John, you're going to hurt yourself. <laughs> but I just want to mention uh, our participation here, the National Park Service. In the 1990s, the Congress passed a strange and wonderful law. Uh, they expanded our boundary by law, but in doing so, they said to us, hey, we want you to tell a broader story. We want to, you to tell not only the story of the battles, but why those battles took place and what was the impact. Particularly, what's the context? Who, who were all the people that took part, not just the soldiers? And also, what was the impact on the American South? John has done a terrific job in starting to reorient our interpretive program. With all the media we have, that's sort of like trying to turn an aircraft carrier. So it, it takes a little while. But John has done a great job. And uh, we are just thrilled to be part of this series of programs, years of anguish. And uh, I hope that uh, you all come back for each one of them as we proceed through those years. Uh, this program, if, this pro if they're all going to be like this program, they're just going to be stellar. Thank you. Thanks, Russ. Uh, Dr. William Freeling is up next with Virginia's struggle with secession. Uh, but first, a brief introduction, if that's possible with someone with a career like Dr. Freeling's. Uh, in 2007, the Oxford University Press published the second and concluding volume of Professor William W. Freeling's Road to Disunion, subtitled Secessionist Triumphant, 1854 to 1861. It won many awards. It became a main selection of the History Book Club, a Washington Post Notable Book of the Year, a New York Times, Sunday Book Review Editor's Choice, and winner of the Hodges Prize, Hodges Prize in Southern Studies. The first volume of that series of Road to Disunion, subtitled Secessionist at Bay, begins in 1776 and moves forward to 1854. Uh, that was published in 1990. It was also a History Book Club main selection. It was the winner of the Owsley Prize in Southern History. Uh, then, together with the South versus the South, how, anti -so how Southern anti-Confederates shaped the course of the Civil War, appearing in 2002 and winner of the Jefferson Davis Prize, the road to disunion reinterprets the causes of the Civil War and of Confederate defeat. These books, researched on a Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship, bring to climax a lifetime's work on the Old South, begun some 40 years ago with the publication of A Prelude to War, the Nullification Controversy in South Carolina, itself the winner of the Nevins and Bancroft Prizes. Not bad, huh? <laughs> Professor Freeling grew up in Chicago, re received his, refused your degree, yes, received his his uh, magna cum laude AB degree uh, and Phi Beta Kappa from Harvard College, where he wrote his honors thesis under public intellectual and historian Arthur Schlesinger, Jr., and his MA and PhD from the University of California, Berkeley, where he wrote his PhD thesis under famed historian Kenneth Stamp. So he comes from good lineage. Um, he's taught at Berkeley and at Harvard and held full professorships at Michigan at Johns Hopkins. Uh, in fact, he left Hopkins just a few years before I arrived there for graduate school, much to my disappointment. Uh, but his name was still spoken of fondly by former colleagues, and his books were, of course, required reading. He moved on to endowed chairs at SUNY Buffalo and at Kentucky. He is now retired from a university career that brought him as many honors for teaching as for books, something we're going to see in evidence here today. Freeling currently writes full-time at the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities as a permanent senior fellow, where his current projects include a book of essays on the Civil War and a reinterpretation of Abraham Lincoln. He and his wife, Allison, also an American history author, live in Charlottesville, close to their two adult children, both journalists, 
one of whom readers of the Freelance Star should be well familiar with. Uh, Dr. Freeling's most recent book is the wonderful Showdown in Virginia, the 1861 Convention and the Fate of the Union, a history of the convention co-edited with Craig Simpson. In addition to picking up the book, I recommend checking out the companion website, showdowninvirginia.com. His talk today is entitled, How Virginia Finally Ended Its Interminable Procrastination. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Freeling. Well, it's a little daunting to be here now uh, after those two incredible speeches by two absolutely wonderful historians. I'm not going to do as well, but I'll do my best. <laughs> and it's, so, it's also a little daunting to uh, be in this beautiful building giving a speech. I've never been in, in such a beautiful place and given a speech on history. And finally, it's a little daunting to have my entire family here uh, uh, for the first uh, time and particularly my two grandsons, Sammy and Tommy, who are here uh, today. It's quite a thrill for a, for a grandfather to have such people. <laughs> I've never known quite why, but they don't call me grandpa. They don't call me grandfather. They don't call me grandy. They call me muck. All I can do today is hope that you don't call me muck after I get done. Well, I have a real pleasure here today, because I get to tell you about a forgotten moment in Virginia's history, one that even the most artisan, ard, ar, ar, ardent fans of Virginia history know that know little about. You know that there are certain other really great moments in Virginia history. You know about the great moment of the Founding Fathers, and Madison, and Monroe, and John Marshall, uh, and Jefferson, and Washington, and, who, and just a whole crew of people who at a critical moment of, of American history dominated. You know all about Robert E. Lee, who uh, at a critical moment of history dominated. But very few of you realize that Virginia had a really great moment uh, just before uh, the Civil War uh, started. That the greatest debate of all on secession, and one of the greatest debates ever held in American history, was held in Virginia. When the Virginia Secession Convention, for two months uh, and two weeks, debated the question of secession. There was nothing like it anywhere in the South. Uh, and for quality of debate, uh, for importance of debate, for what, it, what is illustrated, not only about Virginia, but about American history and about history in general, there is very little in the whole annals of American history that compares to this uh, debate. And Virginians don't even know about it. Uh, and what a pleasure it is to appear in this place uh, and talk uh, about it. There are two reasons why the debate is forgotten. The first reason uh, is the only place it has been recorded is in George Reese's marvelous 1965 edition of the debates in the Virginia Secession uh, Convention. And Mr. Uh, Reese's uh, book uh, did not sell very well uh, and, uh, and is available only uh, in the most arcane libraries because it is four volumes and 40 and 4,000 pages long. 4,000 pages long, which indicates a bit of the length of the Secession Convention uh, and indicates a bit of why you haven't heard of it. Uh, because who but idiots like me would read uh, uh, would read all four thousand uh, would read all four thousand uh, pages. I've done my best to get rid of that reason why the Virginia debate is forgotten by publishing just now a little book uh, called Showdown in Virginia, which is a distillation of those uh, four thousand pages into two hundred pages with uh, head notes and introductions that make those 200 pages uh, very accessible to everybody. Uh, and it's my hope that this little book, much different than those four big books, uh, might bring to the attention of the Virginia population 
what a marvelous moment this is in Virginia history. And the second reason why this uh, debate, I think, is not well known is because of an oversimplification over -simplification of secession itself. The oversimplification that most people carry in their heads, but I doubt that you will carry in your head uh, after you leave this four hours of oratory, uh, uh, is that secession was simple. That Lincoln was elected, and after Lincoln was elected, the South rushed out of the Union, uh, unanimously, excitedly, rushed out of the Union so passionately uh, that they could proceed to fight a, a uh, civil uh, war. And since the whole South rushed out of secession, what does it matter if Virginia talked about it for uh, two uh, months? <laughs> but that's not what happened. The South did not rush out of secession. At the moment after Lincoln was elected, I estimate that no more than 20%, I repeat, 20% of Southerners wished to secede from uh, the Union. Secession is a bitterly contested matter. Uh, and the fact that so many Southerners don't want to secede is uh, the reason why the secessionists rejected what George called before, quite rightly, cooperationist secession. In cooperationist secession, you would call a Southern convention and have the whole South vote on whether they wished to uh, secede from the Union. But if the whole South voted on whether they should secede from the Union, the vote would have been no way by about 80% uh, to 20%, uh, which is precisely why the secessionists didn't wish to have a Southern Convention called, didn't want cooperationist secession, instead wanted each individual state to decide whether it would uh, secede. And the minute that becomes the issue, whether an individual state can uh, secede, all the secessionists have to do is capture one state, one state's majority, not 15 states' majority, but one state's majority. And after they've captured one state's majority, they're in business. Uh, and they got to be more and more in business. And that's the way secession developed with first South Carolina seceding, that putting pressure on other lower South states to secede, secede, so that by February 1st, 1861, seven Southern states were out of the Union, the seven Deep South states, the seven states with most uh, slaves were out of the Union. <clears throat> but there, ladies and gentlemen, the bandwagon stopped and stopped cold because the rest of the South did not wish to jump, on, jump into uh, secession. That rest of the South included two-thirds of the white Southerners and two-thirds of the slaves who uh, were against secession, and most of these states were even against calling a secession uh, convention. With one-third of the South, out of the Union. Two-thirds of the South still in the Union, everything dependent on what those other states decided. If the other states should decide uh, that they did not want to secede, did not want to join the Confederacy, the Confederacy's chances would dwindle in the great race of nations, and particularly uh, dwindle in a civil war. But if the rest of the states seceded, then the Confederacy would be in the ballgame. If all of them seceded, uh, as, I think, as Abraham Lincoln said, and I think he was right, the Union was not going to win the Civil War. If half the other states seceded, the Middle South states, of which Virginia was the leader, then it was going to be a real tussle. Uh, uh, and it was going to be difficult to, to tell who was going to win. Uh, and in this decision by the rest of the South what to do, Virginia was absolutely paramount. First of all, because it was the largest uh, slave uh, state, uh, largest slave state in or out of the Union at this point, and secondly, because it had such immense uh, 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 prestige. So what was uh, Virginia going to do? 
I'll take this watch off so I end just on time. <laughs> Virginia procrastinated. And the reason they procrastinated uh, was that they were badly split. And the first great uh, importance of the Virginia Secession uh, Convention and Virginia's decision is that Virginia is split exactly the way the rest of the South is split. Uh, and so if you study the splits in Virginia, you're also studying the splits in the South. There's one section of Virginia, like the Lower South, that is very densely enslaved, the so-called Tidewater and Piedmont of Eastern Virginia. There is one section of Virginia that is right in the middle, uh, and is about 20% uh, seceded, 20% uh, uh, enslaved. Uh, and that, of course, is the great and beautiful valley of uh, Virginia, which is in the middle, just like the Middle South is in the middle, between the Lower South uh, and the Border South. And then there's that other part, the Border South. Uh, which uh, comprises the state of Maryland uh, and Delaware uh, and uh, Kentucky and Missouri. Uh, and that part, that lower south part, that border south part is very, very similar to Western Virginia. We don't think now of Western Virginia as part of Virginia because it isn't. Uh, but at that point, it decidedly was. Uh, it had 35% of the white population of Virginia, and it had very few slaves, just like that whole section of the border south. Virginia can't make up its mind between these various geographic sections pulling in various directions from a very lightly enslaved area to a very deeply enslaved uh, area, and neither can the south. So as you study the Virginia debate, you're studying the Southern debate, which uh, gives all this subject uh, even greater importance. Uh, and Virginians really did not want to have to decide this one and did not really have the capacity to decide very decisively for a very long time, which is why Virginia procrastinated. Uh, and the state legislature finally gets around to electing delegates to the secession convention on February 4th. This is after an awful lot of history has passed by, uh, when uh, the whole Lower South is out of the Union. Uh, uh, and uh, um, at the very moment when the Virginia voters are trying to decide about secession, the Confederacy, the, the Lower South, South Confederacy, is meeting to establish its constitution. That's how much Virginia has procrastinated uh, about this decision. But on February 4th, the voters go to the, uh, go to the polls, and you've seen one great debate, uh, which took place on uh, February uh, 4th. Now, on February 4th, the legislature asked the voters to decide two things. One thing, to elect their delegates to the secession convention. But if you forget everything else I say for the next 20 minutes, you've got to remember this. Uh, the uh, other thing the voters had to decide was, is it enough for the secession convention to secede? If the secession convention decides to secede, is Virginia out of the Union? Or on the contrary, after the Virginia convention decides, do the people have to decide in a popular referendum? The Virginia people vote on February 4th that the people must also decide to secede. For secession to be legitimate, it is not enough for just the convention to decide, but, it, but the people must also decide. This uh, notion of popular referendum is, of course, very popular with the unionists because it gives them a second chance if they lose in the secession uh, convention. Very unpopular with the secessionists who think Virginia has dilly-dallied quite long enough, thank you, uh, and one, <coughs> one, one, a decision to be made by the convention and that decision to be it. As will not surprise you, it's the Western Virginians who push the popular referendum idea to uh, completion. <coughs> On February 13th, the elected convention meets uh, in, in uh, Richmond. There are many issues, but I think one issue that needs to be talked about today, because it probably hasn't been talked about enough, um, up until now today, we, is 
the issue about blacks uh, and, the, and the way the blacks influenced that, uh, that issue. Blacks do not, of course, appear in the convention any more than women, uh, white women, appear in the uh, convention. Only white men allowed in this uh, convention. But uh, blacks are there as much as if they, they are implicitly there. And they're implicitly there because uh, in the last 30 years, uh, um, before the secession convention, ever since Nat Turner's convention, the, Del the Virginians and blacks had resisted slavery, not by uh, revolution, but by running away. Running away was the great uh, instrument that the Virginia slaves tried to use to liberate themselves. And in the process of running away, they became uh, a voice in the national uh, scene because the, the uh, fugitive slave controversy arose. There would have been no fugitive slave controversy without fugitive slaves. It's as if blacks created uh, that uh, issue. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> you see that same kind of influence, implicit influence, uh, in the Virginia Convention. For one of the great issues that these delegates debate uh, is will secession help or hinder our effort to recapture our fugitive slaves. The unionists argue, it is, it is as they argue about everything, it is madness to secede uh, because if we secede, the national fugitive slave laws will never, will no longer help us uh, capture our uh, slaves. The national government returning our slaves is one of our great bulwarks. Uh, and the more uh, we don't have a national government, the, way, the more we are antagonizing the Yankees, the easier it's going to be for the fugitive slaves to uh, run away. The secessionists argue, on the contrary, that no, 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 the best way to stop the fugitive slaves is to secede, because if we secede, we'll get away from those goddamn Yankees. Uh, uh, and once we're away from those Yankees, they won't care anymore about uh, us, and they don't care about blacks in the first place, uh, so that there will be uh, no Yankee help to uh, fugitive slaves. And these two sides go at each other and at each other on this point. And my, my point is, the point that's got to be emphasized is, without the blacks' implicit contribution of running away, you never would have had the debate take this form. No blacks in the convention, but you know they're there the minute you read the white men debating how they're going to stop <coughs> the fugitive slaves uh, from running away. In the great debate on many, many other issues, the unionists uh, take a series of points that I personally think are brilliant. Uh, and like George, if I was a slaveholder, and a uh, slaveholder in Virginia, I am sure I would have been a unionist. Because from my perspective, the unionists win the debate, uh, which is fascinating in itself. Uh, because you think, if you think of secession as inevitable and something that's obviously going to happen, what in the world is happening with the unionists developing such a powerful uh, argument? Here's our argument. Okay, let's assume for a minute that Lincoln's a menace. Let's assume for a minute that Lincoln wishes to abolish slavery. Let's assume for a minute that if we stay in the union, we're not going to be able to keep our uh, slaves. What in the world can Lincoln do to us? He doesn't have a majority in the House. He doesn't have a majority in the Senate. He doesn't have a majority in uh, the Supreme uh, Court. He's a lonely man in the White House without a party in Congress, without a party on the court. Uh, and why in the world is he a danger uh, to us? And that argument receives even more support, as one of you suggested from the balcony, very shrewd of you, uh, in, uh, the last, uh, in the last uh, hour. That notion that Lincoln is not dangerous receives uh, tremendous support from Lincoln's inaugural address. For in that inaugural address, Lincoln says, a 13th Amendment has been proposed to the Constitution, which it had. That 13th Amendment, he says Lincoln, has already been passed by Congress and sent to the states, which it had. And that 13th Amendment declares that Congress shall never abolish slavery. 
that Congress shall never abolish slavery, and that constitutional amendment is declared unamendable. You cannot amend that uh, Constitution. By the way, whenever I teach Civil War classes, I just have a field day uh, turning to my class uh, and saying, look, if the South had not seceded and this 13th Amendment would have been passed, how long would it have been uh, that slavery would have lasted in America with this incredible constitutional bulwark. And we have some uh, great uh, debates about that, and I wish I could stop right now and listen to you guys uh, <laughs> debate uh, that. But, but it's a great point that the uh, unionists made. By the way, Lincoln says, I not only endorse this idea, I am delighted that this constitutional amendment is irrevocable, his word, irrevocable. Well, why is a man who declares this constitutional amendment irrevocable a menace to slavery, especially when he has no majority in Congress or, uh, <coughs> or uh, on the Supreme, uh, or on the Supreme uh, Court? And asked the unionists, how could we most easily abolish slavery in the Union? The easiest, fastest way to abolish slavery in the Union, say the unionists, uh, uh, to abolish slavery is to secede. If we secede and lose a civil war, which we very well might, we're going to abolish slavery real fast in uh, for five years or less. If we stay in the Union with this constitutional amendment forever protecting slavery, where are our chances better? What madness to gamble on secession. The most we should do is decide that if uh, Lincoln ever passes an, a, 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 an act against slavery, I don't know how they put it, they put it, overt act against uh, slavery, a hostile act against slavery, then we can secede. Then we can secede. Why secede now? Why take a chance? Fabulous argument. And it's just great fun to watch the unionists debate this argument and watch the secessionists uh, squirm. The, the secessionist best answer, I think, all, they have all kinds of answers. Some of you may think some of the answers are, are better than I think they are. But the, the, but, the, but the most fascinating answer comes from George Wythe Randolph. George Wythe Randolph is Lincoln, <coughs> excuse me, Thomas Jefferson's youngest grandson. Uh, and his youngest grandson uh, gets up in the convention and says, in effect, you know, Thomas Jefferson said that slavery was an evil, an evil that we ought to try to get rid of. And for a couple of generations now, Virginians have tried to convince themselves that Jefferson is wrong uh, and that, uh, for, that uh, slavery is not an evil. But, says uh, Randolph, that debate, is, that, that argument has just been going on for a very short time, and I don't think most Virginians believe it yet. In other words, I think Virginians are susceptible to an anti-slavery argument. And I think Lincoln is going to bring an anti-slavery argument into the South by building a Republican Party with the patronage at his disposal in the South itself and by, by, <coughs> by getting these weak-kneed people uh, to uh, start to debate slavery uh, in Virginia. <coughs> Randolph says, I don't care whether Congress can or cannot abolish slavery. That devil, President Lincoln, is going to get Virginians to debate slavery, and I'm not so sure we'd win uh, if the uh, anti-slavery movement in Virginia is supported by the president's uh, patronage. There is some evidence in the Virginia Convention uh, that, <coughs> that he may be right. Uh, and that the, uh, there, there's, a, there's a strong sentiment in Virginia, if not exactly anti-slavery, certainly not pro-slavery, and it comes from those diabolical Western Virginians, uh, who in this uh, convention, and you'll remember this was the area with very few slaves and 35% of the voters in Virginia. These Western Virginian delegates say, in effect, we don't want to talk about secession. Secession's not the issue. The issue is taxation. And the issue is, should big tax breaks be offered to the slaveholders? 
And what we want this convention to do is to abolish the unfair, undemocratic, unequal tax breaks that the Virginia uh, Constitution gives to the, uh, to the, uh, to the uh, slaveholders. Secessionists hear this and they go half mad. Look, we've got a great crisis on our hands. We got half the states out of the union. We've got a civil war almost starting. And what do these traders wish to debate? Taxation uh, and how much uh, taxes uh, we should uh, pay. Uh, and this this taxation issue uh, gives to the uh, to the um, to the lament of the Virginia secessionists, that there's some softness about slavery among whites in Virginia uh, gives, them some, uh, gives them a leg uh, up. The uh, argument that uh, Virginians may themselves turn against slavery does not particularly impress the Virginia Unionists because uh, they are being told, you guys are going to be disloyal. You guys are going to get up against uh, slavery. Uh, and the unionists find this a stupid argument. Uh, uh, they say, we're as loyal to slavery as you are. We just think we have a better way to protect it uh, than, uh, than uh, you have. And you see how profoundly they are winning this debate on April 4th. This, is already, this debate has already gone on for a month and a half. Uh, uh, Virginia has procrastinated for a month and a half trying to decide. And finally, the secessionists move to break up the union, and they lose two to one by a two to one majority. By a two to one majority, the Virginia Convention votes against secession eight days before uh, Fort uh, Sumter. That really throws the secessionists into a tizzy. Uh, and they wonder how in the world they are ever going to rescue this situation uh, now. <coughs> and in effect, Lincoln rescues them. Because uh, on April 12th, Lincoln, uh, as you all know, uh, sends ships to reinforce Fort Sumter uh, and the guns uh, Blair. And still the Virginia Convention does not vote to secede. Still the Virginians want to procrastinate because, argue the Unionists, this may be an isolated incident. Uh, uh, these cannons may be going off in South Carolina, uh, but those cannons will never uh, come uh, to Virginia. That's their war down there, uh, uh, and we can still uh, stay in the Union. And then real disaster strikes, because on April 15th, Abraham Lincoln calls up 75,000 uh, Virginians, uh, excuse me, 75,000 Americans to put down the rebellion. And here's the kicker. He calls up 3,500 Virginians to go down to South Carolina and uh, put down the rebellion. Uh, and at this point, what is the, the issue uh, has changed. I agree with George entirely that up until now, the issue had been uh, how you best protect slavery. But now the issue becomes, do you want to kill your fellow Southerners? Who do you want to kill? Do you want to kill Yankees, or do you want to kill uh, fellow uh, Southerners? Uh, when the issue gets changed like that, the Virginia Convention changes uh, and votes uh, by a two to one margin on April 17th to, uh, to uh, secede. But notice it's a two to one margin. Uh, and there are still a third of the people in the Virginia Convention that don't uh, wish to uh, secede. And they remember that they've got a, uh, an, an outlet here. And their outlet is that popular referendum that has to, be, that has to pass if Virginia is going to uh, secede. Uh, and uh, the hope is now, OK, we lost in the convention, but wait till a month from now. Uh, then we will win uh, in the popular referendum. And this really infuriates the uh, secessionists, who think they have finally won, and now the victory has been brought, uh, has been uh, stolen from their uh, grasp. Whereupon Henry Wise, the ex-governor of Virginia, he's been replaced as Virginia governor in the last few uh, days, <laughs> not because he lost the election, because you weren't allowed to run for re-election, uh, Henry Wise, of, of, of the uh, fame from the time when, when John Brown struck uh, in uh, Virginia. Henry Wise gets up in, 
in the convention. And he pulls out his pocket watch, snaps it open, and says, at this hour, by my orders, the Virginia militia has been ordered to, uh, to seize the Harper's Ferry Arsenal and to seize the, uh, the Newport, the Gosport New Naval Yard. Secession still isn't legal, but wise in effect is starting the Civil War in Virginia uh, by sending delegates, by sending a uh, militia, which he has no right to do, uh, to uh, seize uh, the, uh, the various uh, forts. And says wise, if there's anybody out there who disagrees with me, if there's anybody out there who wants to defy my order to the militia and wants to say I'm just the ex-governor of Virginia, if there's anybody out there who opposes what our brave boys are about to do to seize those armies, nobody has been noticing that satchel that's right by his side. And he pulls into his satchel very, very slowly and deliberately and whips out his pistol <laughs> and says, anybody who wishes to defy me can come right up and look at this. <laughs> now that still does not silence all the unionists who, who think they've been had, who think that they're, that they're now going to have to fight an election under the gun that they were hoping to win on May 23rd. Uh, and instead, they wished to debate whether Wise had any right to do that uh, and whether physical force can be used like this to stop a legitimate election. And they're determined to uh, have a debate. Uh, now, on this issue, um, whether it's, it's, it's legitimate to call for a war for, with guns before the people have decided on May 23rd. And so the, the unionists decide that Mr. John Baldwin should debate Henry Wise on this uh, subject. At this point, I, being Henry Wise, need to call up Mr. John Baldwin to debate uh, this issue uh, with me. or whether these being revolutionary times, we are invested with all manner of power. This convention is authorized to change the whole constitution of the state, Mr. Baldwin. Not without the sanction of the people. The people themselves in calling the convention stated our limitations. Suppose that they have required us to submit all political questions back to them. Is there any man here when the car of war is rushing over the people, crushing them under its wheels, when the whole frontier, when the edge of every bay and estuary is endangered by invasion, is there any man here, will you tell me, sir, whether the welfare of the people does not require us to take the responsibility of doing whatever we can do for their defense between now and the election of May. Sir, the safety of the people justifies the overriding, for the time at least, of acts, of statues, and even the Constitution itself. Not under our system. Under our system, civil war attacks the safety of all, the very viability of the state, the happiness of the people, the Constitution itself. Now to tell me that the convention is bound before it can do anything to defend the people, before it can prevent the Navy Yard from being taken uh, with all its immense stores, shipping and ordnance, before it can capture the forts held by the federal government, among a people destitute of arms, can you tell me that before all that is done, we must await the sanction of the people? That presents an argument too conservative for uh, even a crisis such as is now upon us. The general informs us that the welfare of the people is a sort of higher law known in free government. I deny it. 
I deny that we have any higher law under our system of government than the Constitution. I deny that there can be any welfare of the people in violation of fundamental constitutional principles. The gentleman seems to think that in revolutionary times, the principles of free government are all to be forgotten. It seems to me if there ever was a time to appeal to the great cardinal principles of constitutional power, it is a time like this. This convention, like the people themselves, are under obligations to observe the constitution of the state until it is lawfully changed. It cannot be lawfully changed until it is submitted to the people and ratified by them. The argument of the gentleman, gentleman and his principles be correct. We, the conservatives, or the conservators of the people, can do nothing between now and May. Let the people in stay and say instead, our Constitution, our convention has, has advised us to secede. In order to defend ourselves, we need to take the arms necessary to defend ourselves. So we will take the forts that now threaten our lives and liberties. We will take the Navy Yard that holds all the ship timber, the best in the United States. If we will take the Navy Yard now, we will have plenty of arms and ammunition. If we do not take it, when we vote to secede, we will have no ships, no ordnance, no powder. The argument of the gentleman is that we are to do nothing, to let the powder go, let the Navy Yard go, let the arms at Harpy Ferry, Harper's Ferry go, and all this because of a mere sticking point between Twiddly D and Twiddly Dumb. <laughs> By what authority is war upon us? Who has declared war? The President of the United States, it is true, has threatened a war against the Confederate States, but it is not yet our war until we adopt it. Sir, what right have we when the people have said that our actions shall go back before them to bring about a state of things that would prevent them from having the right to pass upon us? They say revolutions never go backward. And if we start without regard to the proper limitations of power, we are in danger of emerging from this revolution anything but a free people. It may be that we will make this war at a disadvantage. The constitutional law may be unfavorable to success, but I would rather go into a war with all the disadvantages resulting from constitutional power than to throw off the reserves necessary for the safety of the people. I never can consent to leave the principle of constitutional authority, of limited government, and of representative responsibility and restraint to launch out upon any principle <laughs> so vague, so ominous of evil as the principle of the welfare of the people in the name of my constituency, in the name of constitutional law, in the name of constitutional liberty, in the name of representative responsibility, I protest against this act. <laughs> well, he really is George, not John Baldwin. Uh, <laughs> and let me say that this gives me an opportunity to tell you all the George has written just an absolutely marvelous book on religion in the Civil War. Unfortunately, it's not here today because it's not going to be published for a few more days. But it is, I think, the best book he's ever written, which is saying a mouthful. Uh, and it's a book that all of you need to watch when it does uh, come out. So this is the f f finale of the uh, convention. Uh, and after this finale and after war in effect has started in Virginia, everything changes. And everything changes always when there's war, because now the people of Virginia are not voting whether it's wise to secede. They're not voting whether slavery is an issue. They're voting who they want to kill. They're voting whether they wish to kill Yankees or kill fellow Southerners. They're voting on whether Lincoln is a tyrant trying to repress the uh, South. And once that becomes the new issue, it's all over for uh, the Unionists. And in the election on May 23rd, the, uh, the secessionists uh, win by a four to one majority, but the Western Virginians still vote against it. 
And the Western Virginians think they've been had and think that this whole election process has been corrupted by the fact that a war has started uh, arbitrarily before the people got to decide. And it seems to the West Virginians that they've been dragged into this war unconstitutionally, immorally, undemocratically, and they will not have it. And as you all know, they secede from uh, Virginia. So you got two secessions. Uh, uh, <laughs> The secession of Virginia from the Union and the secession of West Virginia from uh, Virginia. And that second secession is very important because it's again emblematic of the South. The, the part of the South that is like West Virginia is the border South, is Maryland and Missouri uh, uh, and, uh, <clears throat> and Kentucky uh, and Delaware. And that part of the South with one third of the Southerners in it and half the Southern arms in it never does secede. Uh, and they support the Union side in the Civil War. And it is my judgment that they contribute mightily to the ultimate uh, victory of the Union by not seceding and by pouring most of their wealth and treasure uh, into the uh, Union uh, ranks. So look at all you learn from this uh, debate, this two months of debate in the Virginia Secession Convention. You learn a tremendous amount about how secession came and how the war uh, came. You learn a tremendous amount about how divided the South is and how those divisions help the South lose the Civil uh, War. And you, you learn in an even broader context about bigger issues. And the great historical debates have to be about those bigger issues. It's not enough to be a great debate, in my judgment, if it's just how do we find out about secession and how do we find out about civil war. This debate marvelously illuminates that American division between military necessity and democratic liberties, a debate which is still with us today, uh, and this is the first great airing of that debate. And you also learn, learn in a universal way about procrastination. The procrastinator can often win, but when the chips are down in a real crisis, the person who knows what they want is willing to do whatever he has to do to do it uh, and is willing to push other people towards him even if it is under the gun. <laughs> it has a tremendous advantage over the uh, procrastinator. One of you, one of the really shrewd questions today was, how did Yancey ever get to the top when he was uh, just a, an outsider? And George's answer was exactly right. You get, to the outs you get to the top when you're an outsider, when the moment is right and you seize the moment. Yancey seized the moment. South Carolina seized the moment. Henry Wise seized the moment. The Virginia procrastinators did not seize the uh, moment, and that's the way it out, all came out. And with such broad importance, such uh, illumination of much broader themes than secession and civil war, Virginia's forgotten moment must be forgotten no longer. Thank you. <laughs> You guys make me want to cry. <laughs> Hi, Bill. That was a superb lecture. And I want to say to you all, as a former graduate and undergraduate student at Bill at Johns Hopkins, you did not dare procrastinate to Professor Freeling when you had to turn a paper <laughs> on time. Um, Bill, I would just add, don't you think that the, 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 um, the secessionists were right about one thing in the uh, Virginia Convention? A lot of the West Virginia leaders, especially a Methodist minister and, and one of the two U.S. senators, Waitman Willie, and his friend uh, Reverend Dolliver, whose son later became one of the few U.S. senators in turn of the century America to stick up for black people. There was an abolitionist conspiracy of so sorts among the Western Virginians, especially these Methodist ministers, don't you think? Oh, I do think so. 
I do think that there's some, uh, this, that, that ladies and gentlemen was Christopher Gray, uh, an ex-student of mine at Johns Hopkins. Uh, um, it's not quite as great a thrill uh, to have a wonderful ex-student come to hear you lecture as it is to have your grandchildren. Uh, <laughs> But anyway, thanks, Chris. Uh, and like a, like a the fine ex-student he was, he's right. I mean, there is a point uh, to the argument that if Virginia had not seceded, they would have tried to develop a Republican Party in Virginia. Uh, and they would have been very successful, probably, in Western Virginia, which, by the way, is represented in the Republican Convention of 1860. And guess who the Western Virginian cast all their votes for? Abraham Lincoln for president. Uh, uh, and that indicates the kind of thing Christopher Gray is talking about. I am not saying for a minute that it isn't possible that this could have happened. The question is, and the question throughout the thing is, which side would you have been on? What, what would have been more dangerous in this very dangerous times? Great to see you again, Christopher. I'm confused. Um, you said they took a two to one vote originally before the, and why didn't they just go home then? Why did they wait a week and take another vote and go two to one the other way? A lot of people were asking that at the time, including Abraham Lincoln. OK, you guys won. Why don't you go home? <laughs> and then the, the answer was, because if we go home, we're scared there's going to be a power vacuum, and somebody like Henry Wise with some goddamn pistol uh, is going to take over the uh, situation. If we stay in Richmond as the convention, we have a power base. And we better stick it out until this whole thing has been uh, decided. Another, of course, marvelous question. Microphone is coming down here. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, the uh, have, uh, has anyone studied the area, the the time of 1865? Those same people that that pushed for the war, what were their feelings after the war? Well, what a great question. Another one, you know, in some ways, I think Virginians still are haunted by that decision, don't you? Uh, and uh, and that, that, that's why we have so much irrational debate now. I mean, this is amazing, ladies and gentlemen. Here we are, what are we, 150 years past the Civil War, and we're still debating these things. Uh, in the North, it's sort of an academic debate. It ain't an academic debate down here. <laughs> And to me, the, the, to me, the point is, and this is why these debates are so exciting, both sides make great points. And that's what you got to have in a debate. You don't want a one-sided debate, uh, if it's going to be uh, the case. It is perfectly possible in the year 2010 to argue that the Unionists were right. That isn't true of a lot of debates uh, 150 years after the event. And I think you're right. That, uh, and I think Christopher is right, that there's a lot of, there's a lot of point to what the secessionists are uh, saying. Just that I personally would have been a unionist. I've been scared to death of what the Yankees would do uh, in a civil war. Dr. Freeling, right down here. <laughs> um, I looked everywhere but it's was, you, sorry. Was there any, was there any consideration of a, a declaration of, of neutrality? Just uh, Virginia won't play? Isn't that a superb question? And what, what's, you, you can answer your own question. Did you, you know? What? Uh, well, I, did anybody I, declare their neutrality? Um, I don't. I don't remember. Yeah. Well, Kentucky declares oh. their neutrality. Uh, uh, Kentucky's in sort of the same position as Lincoln, is, that the Virginia is in. And Kentucky, in effect, says we don't want to secede. We don't want to stay in the Union. We don't want to obey the secessionist law. We don't want to obey the Unionist laws. We don't want to fight in the Unionist army. We don't want to fight in the Confederate army. We're neutral. Uh, and nobody better violate our uh, neutrality. Here, I think, is where you see what, what a magnificent political strategist Abraham Lincoln does. What do you do as President of the United States when somebody declares your neutrality? Well, neutrality is nonsense if you're President. You either do or do not obey the laws, right? Uh, you either do or do not allow the federal government to, to obey its laws. What Lincoln does is he recognizes Kentucky's neutrality. And he lets the Confederacy violate Kentucky's neutrality, which the Confederacy does, uh, and it puts Lincoln in the, in the, uh, in the uh, 
in the driver's seat uh, in Kentucky. But that's a very viable strategy that you have devised, sir. I don't want to fight a civil, a civil war against you. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and, and Kentucky made it pay for a good six months before they, they finally do decide. And, and, then, and then, which, which leads me to the other point, that all of these people are procrastinating. It's not just Virginia that's procrastinating. It's Missouri, and it's Kentucky, and it's North Carolina. It's, it's two-thirds of the Southerners who really don't want to decide this thing, who want it all to go away, who want the, uh, the uh, Lower South to come back into the Union. And when people say there is nothing to secession but, the, but slavery, my answer is, you're right about the Lower South. But look at the rest of the Union. Look at the rest of the government. Is when, those, when Charlie Dew's commissioners from the Lower South come to the Upper South, come to Virginia, do the Virginia delegates fall in line with the Lower South on the slavery issue? No. They do not wish to secede on that slavery issue, uh, and they stay in the Union until the issue becomes not just slavery, but war, and who do you want to kill? And the minute the issue becomes, who do you want to kill? And whether you're going to let your boys be uh, killed, uh, and whether you want somebody to invade you, things change real quick. Got a question on the Constitution uh, question um, that was debated between Lincoln and the Southerners. Okay. <laughs> um, con considering what happened before uh, with George Washington and his presidency, John Marshall with his uh, term on the uh, Supreme Court, and Andrew Jackson all taking a strong central government approach, um, how did all those precedents um, help Lincoln um, in his argument for the supremacy of the federal government over state sovereignty? <clears throat> I think a lot, but I want to say this. George has given a magnificent oration to you guys, and I hope you take it to heart, because what, is, what, the, what the secessionists are saying is not that states' rights are right. They're saying the right of revolution is right. They change the argument from a constitutional argument to a natural rights argument. They say, we, the secessionists, are George Washington. We are Thomas Jefferson. And if King George had, any, had no right to, uh, to uh, enforce the laws against the colonies, why does Lincoln have a right to enforce the laws against us when we have done what any people can do, which is withdraw our right to consent, to go, withdraw our consent to be governed? That becomes a secessionist argument. Uh, and it's a much more interesting argument, don't you think, than this stale constitutional argument where the, the states came before the Constitution or the states. That, that stuff is not exciting, but it is exciting when an American populace puts itself in the tradition of George Washington fighting uh, King George. Not at this point. George, George is right about this again. Uh, in his, and he, uh, Davis had made that argument in the 1850s, but uh, in his inaugural address, Jefferson Davis says, our revolution, and he calls it a revolution, our revolution is right because any people have the right to withdraw their consent to be governed. Now, as George points out, it couldn't be more ironic. Uh, the last thing you want to do is, pro is, pro is propose uh, a universal right to withdraw your consent to be governed, because the slaves might withdraw their <laughs> right to consent uh, to be governed. But nevertheless, that's the plane on which the uh, secessionists are putting their argument. And it's a fascinating and very dangerous plane. OK, I wanna, I'm going to give you a chance to ask your question. But, but I want to ask George to come up, because we're at the point where uh, we can ask uh, either of them questions, right? Uh, but but as George walks up, let's give. Uh, <laughs> my question, I'm on. Yep. My, my question was... Whoever I'm, answers, a, whoever asks, a, raise your hand or stand up so we can see where it's coming from. Before. All right. Well, I don't, uh, I don't stand uh, very tall, but here, <laughs> I, here mm. I am. 
And uh, I just wanted to say it's been a wonderful debate, but uh, I'm standing here among uh, several other people around here who are 10th and 11th generation Virginians. And uh, war on paper and debates are one thing, but when you and your families and have been handed down in your records and your deeds and everything, know that in the Civil War, uh, it is the people, the, it is the population that hurt the worst. We, we lose our men, we lose our uh, stock, we lose our businesses, and then- And you lose your slaves. Well, we didn't have many slaves. My people were Quakers. Mm -hmm. this, this, you're right, this part of Virginia, see, we weren't like a lot of places. And uh, we had some house servants. But anyway, when you've lost everything like that, you have a different view, and not a bitter one. I won't say I ever heard that in, in any of our families. But uh, I do think it's quite a bit of difference when, when you talk about the invasions that you do not also mention that besides losing everything, our courthouses were all uh, burned. Uh, we who in Stafford and, and some of these counties had no records to come back after the, the, uh, the Civil War to have any claims or anything because they would taken care of that too. See, I think you're right. Absolutely right, and that's the point I was trying to make. You're making it for me better than I made it, which is that uh, the Virginians are protecting their homes. They're protecting their, 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 uh, their livelihood. Mm -hmm. They're protecting their households from the Yankee invaders. When the Civil War gets to that point, I don't think just slavery is involved. I think people are fighting for their own liberty. I mean, the, the rhetoric you keep hearing, I'm sure you've seen this too, uh, is that Lincoln is trying to enslave us by sending an army uh, down. Uh, and we will not be enslaved by, uh, by Lincoln's army. To me, I don't know if you agree with this, slavery is absolutely the issue in the Lower South. But the minute war starts, it becomes a very different issue in a place like this. Mm -hmm. Can I say something quickly? Yeah, this like, yeah, it was kind of nice to come here because like, yeah, I had to do like, I was part, because I was in the IB program and like, in, in, in junior year, I remember as part of IB history of the Americas, we had to do a lot about like Civil War and stuff like that and different like historical viewpoints on like, the Civil War and like different historical views views on the Civil War and just like causes and effects of the Civil War and different historical views on why the North won and a lot of like his, we learned a lot about Civil War and a lot of about the historiography of the Civil War and stuff. But I'm just wondering because I know like when I just have two questions quickly. I'm wondering I'm wondering what because I know we when we were talking a lot about the causes of the Civil War and like you know the lead up to the Civil War. Like I know you both have done work on it. One of the questions we were like, we were asked to like discuss in like our exam papers and stuff like that was like, at one point did like the Civil War become inevitable, like become an inevitable feature and become inevitable. And we learned like different views, like some historians said like the Civil War became inevitable after John Brown's raid. Some said it became inevitable like at another point. And then also, and then, also, and also, Why don't also. You stop there, because that's a huge question. Now, I'm sure George would like to answer. Thanks, Bill. What the Civil War inevitable? Yeah. Uh, I've actually changed my mind on that subject. I used to think it was. When I was young and naive, I used to think the Civil War was inevitable. I no longer believe that. Uh, I think that this, the decision was made by human beings. And that's why we're here today, because of all the destructiveness that was alluded to earlier. These debates over secession had fateful consequences. It seems to me the Civil War is only inevitable after the firing on Fort Sumter and when the Upper South secedes. I think that's when the, because decisions were still being made. This debate that was reenacted today was still a real debate. I agree with that. Um, I think it's becoming harder and harder to avoid war as you, get, as you go along and along and along. Easier to avoid war in 1850, easier in 1854, easier in 1857. Just gets harder and harder. But I do think that there's sl some slight uh, chance of avoiding war. Uh, let me just give you two examples from my research on Abraham Lincoln that are going to be in my next book. Uh, first of all, what Lincoln tries to do is he tries to enforce the laws at Fort Pickens instead of Fort Sumter. He tries to enforce the laws in Pensacola, Florida instead of the hotbed of secession, uh, Charleston. 
and for various reasons I'm going to have great fun describing uh, in my book, uh, that fails. And it fails partly because Lincoln himself doesn't watch what he's doing.